Everywhere you look, graphic design is all around you. It's in every book, website, advertisement, brand or product. Graphic design is the art of conveying a message through visual elements, typography and color. And while it might seem as if it's an industry that is only picking up speed in our modern digital world, its origin can be traced all the way back to the start of human existence. It all begins in the caves of the prehistoric human as cave paintings. Back then, the humans were marking their daily lives or the things they valued as paintings on the walls of the caves they lived in. Whether for decoration, keeping track of time, conveying experiences or for religious purposes, the manifestation of human culture can be traced back to 30,000 BC to the Chauvet cave in the south of France. In other continents and from different time periods we can find many other rock or cave paintings which are a testament to the very long history of graphic design. Graphic design continued to develop with society, changing style with each civilization, whether it was illustrated on clay tablets or on papyrus in ancient Egypt, it preserved history through graphics and illustrations. In our modern world, graphic design is used more than ever for all kinds of purposes. It's used to invoke feelings and convey strong political messages. It's used in our day-to-day -day lives in each product or brand we use. Graphic design has been with us from the very start and has been growing with us. It has strong fundamental principles and it's here to stay. Creative design and process. This is the first topic of the course and it depicts the general workflow of a graphic designer, also known as the creative process. How do you become creative? This question has been asked by many people, but it has no right answer. Each person has their own definition for creativity. For some, it's the means to solve a problem and for others, it's to take risks and facing fears. But at its core, creativity is a phenomenon in which something new and somehow valuable is formed. And it's just the same with the creative process. There is no right recipe or formula for the creative process that will guarantee success. You should have a basic understanding of it, but with time and experience, you will learn and create your own process that you're most comfortable with. In the industry of graphic design, each creative process begins with a creative brief. After that, my personal process splits into three phases, which are research, where I gather all the information I would need, concept development, where I let my creativity free and try out different ideas, and finally, production, where the design is finalized and prepared for delivery. In this topic, we will talk about the creative brief, research and concept development. We begin with the creative brief. This part of the process is usually developed by the client or the designer and sometimes collaborated between the two. It defines the goals, the scope and vision of a project. It will identify the target audience, objectives, schedule and any necessary details. While working on a project, you will find yourself referring back to this document to ensure that your ideas and work is meeting the set objectives. Following the creative brief, each great design begins with even better research. When beginning work on a project with an already established brand, you might be provided with a document outlining all of the brand's guidelines. But a lot of times you would have to do your own research and collect all the information you would need by yourself. You would need to get yourself familiar with the client's brand and its values, their personality and what customers they attract, what is their aim and vision, their goals and if they are trying to attract new audience. You'll have to look at aspects of their identity and take into account their distinctive use of colors, imagery, typeface and logos. You will also need to look into their industry and their competition looking into what can be done similarly, differently or improved. The better research you make here before diving into designing, the more likely you are to create 
a successful project that will be relevant to your clients' needs. After completing your research, you will be able to start working on your concept development. This phase doesn't really have a right or wrong way of completing. You could go as simple as just using pen and paper, or work digitally by using dedicated websites where you can easily collaborate with a team and have all of your concepts on the go. You could also combine both digital and traditional ways when developing your concepts and sketches. For example, you could begin by sketching on paper and eventually move to Photoshop, where you will refine your concept before turning it into the final product in the production phase. Whichever way you choose, when concepting, you should let your ideas and creativity free. You could create mind maps where you write down your thoughts, mood boards to inspire you and refer back to throughout this phase. Use any source that inspires you, whether it would be the web, books or so on. This is the process where you can be free to try out anything without being creatively limited. And finally, production. This is the final phase of the creative process, and it's the part where you finally get to work on your already created ideas with the appropriate software tools, turning the concept into an actual artwork ready for print or digital delivery. Later in the course, you will get to experience the work process for yourself with some common designing tasks in Adobe Photoshop. Color is one of the fundamentals of graphic design. It's a really powerful tool which, when used correctly, can have strong and meaningful impact to the viewer. So to learn to use it, you must first learn the basics of it. We begin with a simple color wheel, also known as pigment wheel. It's a very useful tool for understanding the relationships and mixes of pigment-based paints and inks. As designers, even though we might eventually produce an artwork with ink, the pigment wheel is too limiting. So we have other, much more complex tools to mix color available to use. One such tool based on digital color is the one shown here. Its first component is hue. To most people, that would mean the name of the color. But in digital colors, hues are identified by their position on the color wheel. Starting with red at zero degrees and continuing counterclockwise around the wheel. The next component is saturation. It comes in form of a slider, which will change our saturation or also known as intensity. And by changing the value of the slider, the selected hue or color becomes more or less intense. The last component is luminosity, also known as brightness. By reducing or increasing the luminosity of a color, we create shades or tints, just like adding black or white to a pigment. Setting the luminosity to either end would result in completely losing color to either white or black. By combining all of these components together, we're able to achieve a huge variety of colors. As visual artists, one of the main skills you will have to learn is the ability to understand color harmony. In visual arts, harmony is considered something that is pleasing to the eye. It engages the viewer and invokes sense of order and balance. When the colors of an artwork are not in harmony with each other, they could be considered boring or chaotic. The absence of color harmony could result in a bland, unmemorable experience for the viewer. Or, on the other extreme, the colors could be so overdone or chaotic that the viewer won't stand to look at it. Studies have shown that the human brain rejects what it cannot organize or understand. The science behind color harmony aims to deliver order and sense on the subconscious level. Thankfully, all the work and science behind how colors work together has already been covered by numerous great artists throughout the ages. Before you can begin creating amazing color combinations, we would have to go over the basics of color mixing and we begin with the three-part color wheel containing the well-familiar 
primary colors, red, yellow and blue. As you probably already know, in traditional color theory used in pigments and inks, the three primary colors cannot be mixed or formed by any other combination of colors. They are the primary mixing ingredient and every other color is formed by mixing them. Then we have our secondary colors, green, orange and purple. These colors are formed by mixing the primary colors. And finally, tertiary colors. These are the colors that are formed by mixing secondary colors with primary. Now that you have basic understanding of color, we can dive deeper into the different harmonic rules. There are many theories for harmony, but for this introduction we will go over a few of the basic and fundamental formulas. One of the most basic harmonies is the monochromatic harmony. It's based on a single hue with variation to the value of luminosity. This way, tints or shades of the base color are created without breaking the harmony. Another basic color harmony rule is the analogous colors, in which colors that are side by side on a 12 part color wheel, such as yellow green, yellow, and yellow orange, are considered in harmony. Usually with this harmony, one of the three colors predominates. And finally, one of the most popular color schemes is the one based on complementary colors. And it's actually considered to be one of the main fundamental rules in graphic design. In this harmony, colors that are opposites on the color wheel are combined to create maximum contrast and stability. Now that you're armed with all this creative knowledge, you will be able to choose the correct colors for your projects and you will be able to amaze your audience. But there are two technical color models that as a graphic designer you must understand. They are RGB and CMYK. You might have heard of CMYK before and you might know a little about it. But simply put, RGB and CMYK are two different color mixing modes. They're both very common and are used on a daily basis for different purposes, as each one produces a different color range through different techniques. As a quick reference, the RGB color mode is used for monitors and other light emitting devices, such as TVs and screens, while CMYK is used for printing. But to fully optimize your design, we must go over the mechanisms behind each of the two color modes. To start off, RGB, or red, green and blue, is the color space that is currently being used while you're watching this very course. You should use the RGB color mode when your design is supposed to be displayed on any kind of screen, whether it would be a phone, computer or any other kind. The RGB color mode creates each specific color by using the light source found within a device. By combining red, green and blue and varying their intensity. This kind of mixing begins as a black darkness and by adding each of the three main colors as light on top of each other it brightens and creates the desired pigment. When red, green and blue light is mixed together at equal intensity they create pure white. In this color mode we are able to control hue, saturation and luminosity to manipulate how light on screen manifests to create the color we want. Unlike RGB, the CMYK or cyan, magenta, yellow and black color space is used for printing materials. It's one of the most common and commercially available pigment combinations and can be found almost everywhere, from professional printers to the printer you might find at home or your office. Unlike RGB, where light is used to create a desired color, with CMYK, physical ink is combined by the printing machine to achieve this. This method is also known as subtractive mixing. And all colors begin as blank white as the paper we insert in the printer. By adding each layer of ink, we reduce the initial brightness to create the preferred color. When cyan, magenta and yellow are combined, they create a low density black. 
And here is where the fourth pigment known as key or black comes into play. By adding it, we create the pure black that we are used to seeing. Now that you are familiar with both color spaces, you should start to see how they are both quite similar, but at the same time, they are kind of opposites to each other. With RGB, we are adding energy-based colors together, and by combining all of them, we get white. While with CMYK, we are subtracting pigment-based colors, and by combining all of them, we get black. The final part of color theory is color association. Throughout history, color has been used for many different purposes, whether it would be for religion, wealth, or to show a person's position in society through clothing and other means. It's always had a deep symbolic meaning and association. In our modern world, different cultures associate color differently. For example, in the West, the color red is commonly associated with warnings and danger. It is also associated with feelings like love and anger. While in China, it's considered the color of luck. It is also the color of joy and creativity to Hindus, while at the same time, it's considered to be the color of death in some parts of Africa. Of course, you're not expected to know each association of a specific color, but this just shows how important the early research phase from the creative process is, as it could affect the whole design process if not done correctly. Music